Yo, what's good, LL Nation? We apologize for the delay. It is totally my fault today. It's all on me. Got a last minute call. Had to go handle something for my parents. And I tried to tweet out that we had bumped the show back. And I wasn't able to adjust the time in my YouTube studio on the app. I couldn't figure out how to adjust the time. So I didn't have my laptop. Otherwise, we would have pushed it back in the notification. I wouldn't have had you guys waiting around for almost an hour. So we apologize for that. Uh, just hit Malik, told him I made it back to the crib. So he's going to be logging in soon. LL Nation, we appreciate you guys. Shout out to everyone that showed love over the weekend that I ran into. Uh, the uh, gentleman, Clay, and his daughter that I sat next to during the Blue and Gold game, they were a joy to be around for two hours and talk Notre Dame football and just talk about what we were looking at. And, um, yo, LL Nation is strong. You know, I was rocking the hat. Everybody was loving the hat. I see the questions in the chat. They were sent to me on Twitter over the weekend. He's getting ready. It's going to be pre-orders for all the first tees and all of the hats. So that's going to be popping off real soon. We appreciate all of the support. And right now we're trying to figure out what charities we're going to be connecting with for the proceeds, for a percentage of the proceeds for everything that's sold. I'm going to have one locally here. And Malik, I'm sure, is going to have one that's dear to his heart. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not it's going to be out on the West Coast or if it's going to be somewhere in the South Bend area. But we will let you know that. Um, everything we sell will be connected to a charitable organization or to a cause. Um, that's what we're all about, the Lucky Lefty Nation. We're about the people. And because the people make us, you guys have caused us to have success. And we appreciate you and whatever you bless us with. And supporting us and our merchandise, we definitely want to go ahead and sow that seed into someone else's life to be a blessing. And uh, that's what we believe. So, as I said before, it was a fantastic, fantastic weekend down in South Bend. And we both arrived. Well, he arrived Wednesday. I arrived Thursday. Uh, we stayed in the same spot. Uh, pretty much broke bread, watched basketball games, chopped it up. Was him some uh, historians had a nice sit down with Eric Hansen, formerly of the uh, South Bend Tribune. Now he's with Rivals. He's one of the uh, elder statesmen, and uh, it was great. It was great, man. Sat down and talked to him about thirty minutes, and just talked to him about some of the great games he had an opportunity to cover, and uh, we enjoyed some Anora whiskey as we broke bread and everyone was impressed. Everyone thought it was a very smooth whiskey. And uh, then I sat there cause I'm not a whiskey connoisseur. So I had the opportunity to sit there and talk to whiskey connoisseurs, talk about different types of bourbons and whiskeys. So it was very educational for me. I was like, wow, I didn't know it went that deep when it comes to whiskey, aged whiskey, the different tastes, all of that, you know, so. And then from that, I actually went home. When I got home Saturday night, shout out to my beautiful wife for creating a beautiful birthday celebration and connecting all, all of the people that love me, man, going back to my childhood. And all, everybody that reached out on social media, everyone that reached out uh, via text, phone, whatever, man, the love was definitely felt. Saturday was one of the most amazing days, you know, culminating, I mean, starting with the game and culminating with the celebration when I got back to Chicago and the food was great. Uh, shout out to uh, Pinstripes, um, where we actually ate dinner before everything. And what did I, it was the Italian jambalaya. It was recommended to us or recommended to me by the waiter and the Italian jambalaya with like a cheese risotto with this homemade sausage and sausage, shrimp, chicken, tomatoes. It, dude, 
was fantastic. Fantastic. So, man. And then the next day was our 23rd anniversary, our 23-year anniversary for me and my wife. So everything just kept going and getting better. And uh, I don't know if you guys have one locally, but if you don't, check out Putt Shack. Putt Shack. It's a great time. Great date. You know what I mean? Even if you just go with your fellas. It's a great time. Great food. Check it out. Putt Shack, man. I don't know if you have it in your area, but it's new to the Chicagoland area out in Oak Brook. And, yo. Great weekend, man. I Look. It was a great weekend. I actually started the weekend. I left on Thursday. Stopped at Andrean High School and um, watched Drake Bowen play. Fantastic third baseman, by the way. Fantastic third baseman. Watched him play, watched his team play. They played Chicago De La Salle. It's a pretty good game. Both teams going at it. Andrean pulled away. Drake was like two for two, two triples. And um, he got hit twice. Yeah, he had two hit by pitch. So that was funny. We talked about that and had a couple of great defensive plays in the field. One charging, coming in, throwing off one leg, off balance across his body, making a fantastic play. So the one thing that I saw immediately is how athletic and agile this kid is. He also had three stolen bases. So he's super fast. And it was funny. That was the first thing I told Malik. When I saw him, I was like, yo, I just came from watching Drake. I came, just came from watching Drake play baseball. And he was like, yeah. And I'm like, yo, this dude is like, I think he's a little bit more agile than what we think. Like, because you, to play third base is like, yeah, to come in on the ball, grab it, barehanded, throw across your, across your body, have the strength to make the good solid throw. It's like, yo, this kid is agile. And then I saw him steal three bases. I was like, oh, okay. The speed is real. Like, the speed is real. So, do you think they're better athletes than football? Baseball. Better athletes? You want to be honest? You look who I think is the most amazing athlete. I think soccer players are like the most amazing athletes, bro. Okay, but between, between football, football and baseball. baseball. Between football and baseball, by my eyes, I probably would lean football just by my eyes. Okay. You know, because you would really have to spend time around immediately. I'll give you a perfect example. You walk on the baseball field, the first person I will tell you, two people I will tell you to watch is a shortstop in the center field. Could you tell how athletic Michael Jordan was when he played baseball? Heck yeah. Heck yeah. The fact right. that, that dude, the fact that that dude, the fact that that dude was able to steal 20 bases. Like, dude, that's not, people that play baseball know. Like, dude, you just don't steal 20 bases. In a short amount of time he played. So that show that immediately shows you his speed and agility. Like it trans it's transfers. It transfers. And if he played football, I think his speed and agility would have transferred. I don't know what position. As, as tall as he was at six six, he was slender. Would he have been a wide receiver? You know? Oh. Would he have been a defensive back? And that's the amazing thing about athleticism, bro. Like, you sit there and you watch somebody. Let's be honest. We watch Drake's film as a football player. And he's like, you watch the film and it's like, oh, he's a bruising back. And he's a linebacker. Right? He's a bruising running back, power running back, and a linebacker. Then you go watch him play third base and you're like, yo, this kid is agile. And then you go see him and you're like, okay, this kid is like, him is, is slim. He's well built, but he's a slender frame. So it just makes you interested in seeing like what type of player he can be. I don't think he ends up in the middle. 
mm. as a linebacker. I think he ends up possibly as a rope, something like that, on the outside. Would you say he's that? Isaiah Simmons athletic. Simmons athletic. Ooh, that's that's you talking about rarefied air, bro. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? When you start talking like Isaiah Simmons, that's Isaiah Simmons played safety, linebacker. I'm talking about within the same game. Yeah. Yeah. He played like safety, linebacker, and would blitz off the edge. Does he have dude? I'm telling you. Jalen Sneed has Jalen Sneed has that type of athleticism. He just needs to add some weight. Yeah. yeah. When you start talking about Isaiah Simmons, because he look, the kid was the biggest kid on the field and was playing safety in high school. Yeah, that's true. So you know he's if he gets bumped down the rover, think about that. Like he could go back to certain packages because he's played the position and playing a nickel. He could drop in coverage. He could play middle and nickel. Like that's the type of kid you're talking about. I don't know if he meets athletically. I don't know if he meets that same athleticism, but he's definitely more athletic than what you would think if you just watched his football film. Right. Like if you just watch his football film, I think watching football can kind of lock people in into what they think about you athletically. If they watch you play a certain position, he plays middle linebacker. So what's the mindset about middle linebackers, right? Like these are the thudders. You know, they come down, pop, stop the run, right? Then you go watch them play baseball, and you're like, wait a minute, hold on. Like different set of skills. skills. Yeah, it's a little more to this kid than what I thought just from watching him play linebacker. So that that's an interesting question because at first look, I would say football and i played baseball man look baseball to me is more skill than athleticism because hitting a hitting a ball that's 100 miles per hour is really not athleticism because i I know some of the most athletic guys that That struggle no 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 the most athletic guy on the team struggles to hit the ball i do i've seen it like okay. the absolute fastest dude, most <laughs> athletic dude, cannot hit the ball, dude. <laughs> he does not have that skill set. Okay. You know what I mean? So that's, that's like, like dudes, dudes with braids can't yeah, really do for real. Absolutely. 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 I'll give you a perfect example, right? You can take somebody like Mike Trout, super athletic. He's really good at hitting the baseball. You could, but at the same breath, you can take somebody, shout out to Miguel Cabrera, who just had his 3,000 hit this weekend. Miguel is nowhere near athlete, as a, athletic as Mike Trout. But that dude's back the ball and eye coordinate, dude, high, eye hand coordination is like superb. Superb. And I don't care how slow he is. You just watch him hit and you're like, yo, that's a skill set. That he was just given by God. Like that's that's just God given. Mm. You know, so that is the thing about baseball that I would think is kind of specialized. If you're fast on the football field, the majority of the time you can make an impact, right? Like uh. if you're if you're just super fast on the football field, even if it's special teams. Speed, Speed is appreciated. Very, you know, yeah. they don't yeah. try yeah. a lot of different things right. because that's, that's the perception. Right. Then you, see, you guys see guys like, like Tyree Hill, but Tyree Hill is a football player that's fast. Out of out fast, of fast football. football. Yeah, I think he was very underrated coming out of Oklahoma State, and I, I don't think people realized how fast he was coming out of Oklahoma. State. That's right. That's right. And so once he put that together, and I still say, look, man, he'll be missed. But yo, who's gonna miss who more? Tyree, Tyree probably, probably missed. Miss. 
Yeah, dude. Because hold on, I'm gonna come back in a minute. Pat is Pat. He's gonna reconnect. Pat is Pat. You know, so that's a big way because from the comments, I see what you guys want to talk about. If you saw our preview show on Friday night, Malik talked extensively about watching the practice and watching how well watching how well Drew Pine played in that said practice. And we got to Saturday and all of a sudden it was like it was like Space Jam, dude. They stole it. <laughs> <laughs> it was like I was next to Mr. Clay and his daughter and we were just talking and I'm like yo, I don't I don't know. Like I have no clue what what has happened to Brian. Like is well, I think well, that at the end of the day we figured out that he was a third was string guy for a reason. For reason. And when you're dealing and with you're dealing that kind of stuff, kind of stuff, you put a lot of expectations lot on him because he was putting the media as a guy as a competition, but. Mm-hmm. If he's out there, looking, he's like out there that, looking like that, I can only imagine probably can can't be too much better be if, too much better if there's, a there's a serious competition between, competition between the two. Is there a serious competition, though? You know, because it could just be lip service. And that's just one day. Like I said, I didn't see him on Thursday. You did. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you know... From what you told me and what you told everybody on Friday's show, everything was different. Totally different. He walked in in front of the fans on Saturday in the same – I mean, they practiced in the stadium Thursday. So yes. he walked into the same – walked into the same field, had a totally different outcome than he did on Thursday. So I, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, I yeah, think it's just, just uh, uh, some guys, guys are just, just better, better in practice. practice. And then there's and then guys, there's guys that are game time, time players. players. I think Tyler, Tyler Buckner is better, is better in, the in the game. But then but I then do I think, think that, that uh, because, because of that, that it's, it's hard, hard to see it in practice, practice, which makes Drew look better in practice. So you get that 50-50. But this goes this back goes to why I think the Spurs should have decided who they want to go for in the fall. Mm. Because, because now, now you can get serious and work through the, the roast parts of each of those guys' deficiencies that they took to 100% with. Yeah. Look at the podcast. As always, brought to you by Anora Whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. It's that premium American whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. It was all it was all over the place in South Bend. All over the place, Malik had multiple, multiple uh, signings. He was with the Irish Players Club. He was also doing tastings with the Nora Whiskey. Got a chance to get another bottle to Marcus Freeman. And like I said, had uh, had ND alums loving, loving the brand and loving the whiskey all weekend long. So go to AnoraWhiskey.com. And get you some of that Anora whiskey. And if you indeed do drink, make sure that you drink responsibly. So what what was your what's your overall view on what Hunter Biven, Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman, Chad Bowen, and everybody put together for recruits, players, and the game itself over the weekend? Well, I think it's I wonder what's going on. Why is this being doing that? You're good. We can hear you. It's got an echo. Is that me? Don't worry about it. Go ahead. I'll try and figure it out. Okay. Um. Um. Let me see. Let me see. Is this better? Yeah, you Uh, good. (laughs) 
what I think Marcus Freeman is doing, doing, man, and seeing it in person, person, I think it's special because, because of the fact, the fact that, that the feeling you got from all generations of guys that have been through the program connected on something that felt like a common ground. I think that was behind what Marcus Freeman is trying to do for a culture in terms of physicality and unity. You know, you know, bringing, bringing guys, guys together, together and that real strength, strength and giving us the edge that we need as a program to change that perspective, have something that's uh, a refreshed tradition that gives us the attractive quality to recruits and just the ability to garnish that energy to go all the way across the country and, and do the things we need to do become that new dynasty. So I heard a bunch of recruits that I talked to say that the coolest thing was actually, I don't, to be honest, I don't even think recruits were paying that much attention to the game. I'm going to keep it a buck. Mm -hmm. They were so caught up in talking to one another and talking to all the former players that that pretty much just stole the show for all yeah. of them, right? Like a guy like Drake Bowen, who like is locked into the Bears, like, talked about how cool it was for him to get time with Cole Komet. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. He's like, yo, yo, the best part of the day was talking to Cole Komet and some of the other players. That's right. right. And, and, that's, that's, and those, those are really the people that are motivating, motivating the recruits to see it in person, person of what Notre, Notre Dame can do to them, them provided they, they, they play and do the things they need to do. You can really see how it's developed with something special. special. Yeah. When the, when guys, the guys be like, you just played here, yeah, now you're playing for the team, team I want to play for. for. I think I that's think just louder than a coach's resume, resume or what a coach can do for you necessarily. So you moved from that. What did you think about the defense? Man, Man I, love I love the defense. defense. I, love I love what the linebacker showed. He looked tough. He looked up tough front. up front. Mm -hmm. Like I think like, you know, the offense you know, didn't have his best day, but I do have to give credit to what the defense was able to do on the aspect of how effective they were in making it hard for you to have yards after your catch or run. And what about um this is a crazy thing? I didn't really even see Al Golden a lot. Like, I knew he was out there. I saw Tommy. I saw Marcus. But it was like he was almost like a ghost, right? Oh, my gosh. He was a ghost the whole time. You know, the funniest part was I ran into Al Golden one-on-one -on -one in the goo where he popped up out of nowhere. You know, I was walking somewhere. He popped around the corner out of nowhere. I got, like, five or ten minutes to talk to him. But other than that, I didn't really see him at the game. I didn't see him after or before. Even at practice, it was hard trying to find where he was at. Because he was just, I mean, he was floating. You know, he was there, but he was floating around. And when you saw him, it was in glimpses. So when you coming from the NFL, I'm sure you have the art of uh, getting lost. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that within itself could be um, one of the biggest moves ever, man. When you think about. This is one of the reasons I like Marcus Freeman, right? He removes himself from for being the reason. You know what I mean, for a first-time head coach, it would be very easy for him to hire Al Golden and then micromanage Al Golden out of some insecurity. You know what I mean? Like, yo, yeah. this dude has cachet. He's coached before. Perceive him as a threat. Let me constantly watch over him and micromanage him. And what he's actually done is gave him the keys to defense. You know what I'm saying? And that shows just confidence Marcus Freeman has in himself as the head coach to delegate and say, you know what? I trust you. Go do your thing. Yeah, I think it's important that Marcus Freeman really, really depends 
and looks up to those those coaches that he talks about are his favorite coaches to look up to yeah. because he values what that brings as a coach in situations like that. If it, if it wasn't for some of the traits of the Trestles and the Popovich and the Coach K's that he looks up to, he wouldn't be able to handle that on an ego side, bringing in a Super Bowl defensive coordinator Mm. Fresh off of the NFL professional league at its highest elite level. So his ability to see it from the perspective of I'm trying to build a long-standing program and not just be the, the biggest tool in the tool shed <laughs> going into the, the season, trying to be the face of everything. Right. I think it's uh pretty impressive, especially for a first-year guy trying to make an impression not only on the team, but on the people watching, you know, the suits out there. Yeah. And I think you saw one of the things that jumped out to me. We talked about some of the players, some things I saw on the sideline, because I was sitting like in the fifth row behind the blue team. And I don't remember the first series. There was a third and 12 or something like that. And Drew Pine threw a really good ball to Deion Cozy. Right? And it was in between, like, the defensive backs were, you know, bearing down on him. But he should have made the catch and come down with the ball. And so at the end of the first quarter, Marcus Freeman is running to the other side of the field. And he runs by and he says, Deion, Deion. You got to make that catch. Like, we need you to make that catch. And it was at that moment I was like, okay, like, Deion Cozy is one of these dudes. Like, they don't have anybody like him. He is like the jump ball, 50-50, go up and get it. Guy that they need to come on, like Miles Boyd on late in his career. You know what I'm saying? Like, be that guy. Be that physical guy for us that can go up. Threw a nice ball. He came down with it in the red zone, but he was just out of bounds. So the throw was really on. I think that was Angeli that threw that ball to him in the end zone where he couldn't uh, get both, well, get one foot down in the end zone. But he has to be that guy. Drew Pine missed him wide open in the end zone for a touchdown. Like, he just came across wide open, and Drew Pine threw it right into the ground like yeah and i was surprised because drew pine's ball carriage was really good uh during that practice i saw him throwing dimes he gets into the game he mm -hmm. doesn't take a drop so he's he's right behind the offensive lineman i don't know i can see very well yeah. and with a low ball carriage he's just throwing things in the dirt all over their head so i was just pretty uh pretty upset because of the fact that you know i thought he was impressive in practice and it could translate but sometimes it doesn't for guys. But then again, yeah. maybe the game has to slow down for even if that like that, because in reality, he hasn't taken many live reps. And it was and it was shown. I mean, he was doing double duty yeah. and it seemed like a lot. Uh, and that's not what you want to see, you know, for a guy that has as many years as he does. But that just goes back a little bit to the development of the room in total. The guy's been hanging in the room long enough especially in the season to see a Jack Cone and or somebody with more of his skill set, you would think you'd be more prepared for something where you're getting even more reps than you've ever had probably all spring. So yeah. um, hopefully the, hopefully they see that trend that maybe if we give the guys a hundred percent of reps, they'll be better, more consistently to being hot and cold throughout a game. Yeah. So what was the most impressive group for you? I'm going to tell you some guys that impressed me. I'll, I'll throw this one out, dude. Steve Angeli might end up being the second back at the end of the year, bro. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, man. I'm, because you could tell you could tell that Tommy likes him. Right? I think he moves a lot better than I promise you. He moves a lot better than I thought he could. A whole lot better. Decent arm. And I don't feel like he he didn't look like he was overwhelmed by the moment. 
But this is something that always happens, right? You go back in the history of blue and gold games, the third quarterback always, always makes a play. Yeah, you just – you're dealing with uh, – it's not about so much him, it's about the other guys. Yeah. So the guys he's playing against are really the guys that's never going to play. So you're getting kind of that one-up advantage. But, you know, it was good to see him show some athleticism. I would like to see him do that against Fowski. I think uh, that matchup right there just makes all the difference. <laughs> we'll see. But we'll see. but I do think his skill set was more surprising. Like you said, I didn't think he could move as fast as he was. Uh, he made a playmaking play at the end of the game. Uh, to win, running it in like that, it, it it looked clean. He looked like he had some speed on that. He took a good little lick. Uh, I think it was it was fun to watch him. I think from a, if you had to close your eyes and and just look at just the numbers of things, I think he would size wise, and if you just had to eye test it, he would look like the second or the the, the starter just off of that. Mm -hmm. But I think that will stand the test of time. Like, you physically got to be a certain level to really be consistent. Um, and I think Angeli has all the traits for those. Yeah. I think Bugner – I think he's even bigger than Bugner. He, he's more of yeah. a Paulus yeah. kind of deal. So, a stature like that, he can move a little bit. You know, you can you can talk a little Deshaun, you know. Um, Deshaun's mm. probably a little longer. Yeah. But from just a – Wanting to put his neck in there a little bit, you can see a little bit of Deshaun. Uh, but uh, I think Buckner and him, I think that'll be good competition down the road. Hopefully, uh, it makes them each better. The next, the next person, it's really dude. Look, man, it's something about that dude, twenty one, man. He's the smallest dude. Bro, I'm telling you, he's the smallest dude on the field. Yeah, he's small. He's small. He's the smallest person. dude on the field, but he's yeah. so big. He, like, takes up space. Yeah. Like, just who he is and how he comports himself on the football field. The way he plays. He's like, yo. He he's reminds me a lot of a, a freshman year, Sean Crawford, mm -mm. Uh, before the injuries. Because Sean was just like that super small guy. But you just couldn't just couldn't figure it out over there. So he's kind of like a a mix between uh, a guy like a Sean and a guy like a Cody Riggs because he's got some really good technique. Yeah, he's gonna gamble, and he's tougher than what you would think. You yes. know, because he's small, he's damn near one of the toughest on the field. So oh man, complex for real. <laughs> yeah, and he and he it just the way he's making plays. It's like. He's getting the plays his way because people don't think he can really hang out there. Mm -hmm. And then he surprises people because he's actually talented. So he's kind of baiting quarterbacks just off of what he looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and they're and they going to learn. You know, at first he's going to run it up because they're not going to think so. And he's better than what you think. So then you you mess around, throw a ball that's off kilter. He's, he's definitely got the skill enough to come down with that. Man. Like As hard. opposed to like a Cam Hart where you're like, yeah. I'm not even going to try it. You know, right. I'm like, he's about 6'3", huge. I'm not even going to look his way. Right. I'll go 21's way, but, you know, he ended up being damn near more skilled. You know, right. you never know. Right. The other thing I want to point out is I was like, yo, Malik is in this stadium jumping up and down. Like he might not be doing physically, but on the inside, he is doing backflips. Because these linebackers. <laughs> These are not the same linebackers from the Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> like, I'm telling you, I'm in the Goog, and it's like every player was a linebacker. They all 6'2", 6'3", big, strong freshmen. <laughs> it, wouldn't even be, it wouldn't even be the same. We all freshmen. All, yeah. I'm like, yeah, did y'all recruit anything else? It's like they got a team full of linebackers and safeties. Right. And, I, and I know the receivers because they hang out together, but it's like two or three of them, you know, but. I mean, it, the, the locker room is walking around a lot of testosterone and weights because those there's a lot of them. And it's like, yo, this is crazy, yo. Prince Polly looked good. Yeah. Maris looked good. Jordan Batello, dude, Jordan Batello has been 
dominating practices. We've been hearing it all spring long. It's the Hawaiians. They got so many so Hawaiians on the team model. now. Like they just start inside as a freshman. Like yeah, all them Hawaiians that we got right now. They just like and you talk to them, they be like, yeah, yeah, nice, just real nice guys. But on the field, man, they they go and do their thing. So we definitely changed the dynamics of our linebacking core really yeah. fast, and it showed. It showed that we put the effort in recruiting in the linebackers. Is paying off dividends, so that's why I can't really get too mad at Drew because we're not going to see a, a a linebacking core with as much effort that's put into it as as the Notre Dame linebacking core is, and they got the the coaching staff to prove it without Golden, James Lord Nitus, and Marcus Freeman having some input in that room. You're talking about a room that's producing buckets and potential first rounders. I think that's uh, the change that you're going to see uh, first and foremost. Man, I apologize about that, man. We got dinner going right now. Why That's right. You know, what, you, what, you, what you got, get out? You've been, turkey you been winning the last couple of days. Turkey man. wings ready. <laughs> <laughs> lucky, lucky podcast. Yeah, I know you distracted. you like, man, when is this over? <laughs> going off like, yo, spin it different. Nobody does it like us, man. Once again, we appreciate everybody that was out there to show so much love, myself and Malik. All weekend, we heard, yo, lucky lefty, lucky lefty, lucky lefty. It was just an amazing weekend, and we appreciate you guys. The D-line is what you were worried about, bro. How did they look? I like what we saw. I mean, I think it was a good all offense and defensive line day. We saw a lot of potential from both from both sides of the football where it was competitive enough to where you can say, okay, you can shake it up at the end of the day and feel good about it. There's things that both sides can work on, but the stars did show. Uh, it was just impressive all across the board, man. I'm excited to see how we look against other offensive lines and defensive lines because I do think that in particular, those sides of the football are going to get better by the time we play Ohio State, which is important because I think Ohio State is is lacking in a lot of what we are gaining this offseason in terms of an edge, a physicality, an identity on offense and defense to what we want to establish ourselves as. I think Ohio State is kind of losing some of that due to a lot of transfers, due to a lot of coaching havoc, but as well as the fact that, you know, losing to Michigan can set you back a, a long time. So I think that we have all the right stuff in our Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. and there's a little uh, – some SHIT in Ohio State that's, that's keeping them a little uh, back from uh, getting to what we're, we're coming on to. Yeah. I like what I saw from Riley Mills. And the one thing I like, yo, this team looks different. You tell me, bro. I've, man, I've seen every Notre Dame team since, like, 1986 when I officially tapped in. This is a big squad, bro. Yeah, this is a Notre Dame team that's not your neighborhood. You know, everybody in the school went to – grew up with each other type of team. This is a team that you're really grabbing guys from all over the place that are elite talent, and you're coming in here to do one thing, and, it, and it's really come to – change the dynamic of what we feel from this team. I think we fit more in line to like what a Clemson feels where you're importing so much talent to where it's a, more of a, you know, a business factory instead of a, you know, you're trying to win the your division. So I do think that uh, Marcus Freeman has set a precedent of, uh, like I said, testosterone in the building. You got 50,000 linebackers in there now. And some people not going to be happy. They're going to walk around with some mean faces because playing time is, is coming around the corner, and guys understand that, and they know that this offseason is going to be important. Chris Ayers, thank you for tapping in. Good. Can Indy guard OSU on the back end and Indy attack OSU on the perimeter? Well, I, I think we're not going to have to. I think it's like playing the Warriors. We're not going to try to out-throw them. I think that would be foolish to try to C.J. Stroud and Tyler Buckner our way to victory. I do think that 
We'll be better in the back end, but I think the front seven is going to give us more time to do some different things to make it harder for them to just throw for 5,000 yards against us in the first game. And I think for us to be able to attack them on the outside, it's just going to be able to take advantage of the 50-50 balls, like Deion Cozley coming down with a grab, maybe Brady Lindsey separating on a go ball. But they're not going to be the reason why we beat Ohio State, but they will be a big part in loosening up the defense so we can run the ball again. <laughs> we thank our brother Truman Dumel, as always, for another super chat. Give me a breakout player for defense and offense. My picks for Aldrick, Jr., and Barnes. Barnes was laying the wood, fam. <laughs> Yo, he caught a couple of cats in the third, fourth quarter, <laughs> like on out routes. He caught a tight end. I forget, 880. Man, put him down. I was like, bro. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking for some thumpers out there. Like we said, we want some thumpers. Some road graders, some bullies. You know, I, I really want to see breakout Prince Collie from last year. I know a lot of people want Maris, but I think Prince Collie is going to set the precedent from a athletic, versatile, and physicality standpoint. Mm -hmm. He's going to bring all three. I think Maris is going to do a great job from a leadership yeah. and a consistency standpoint. But those need to be the two guys defensively that that get those guys centered in in tough situations. And then offensively, I think it's still the the it's the the ruling is out because we need still need to figure out our quarterback situation. So it's gonna be hard for anybody to do good if we throwing the ball in the dirt or we're not blocking how we're supposed to. So if I had to guess, it would be out of the running back room. Um, one of the superstar running backs we got, I think Logan Diggs should step up in the offseason and take more of a commanding competitive push. For those other guys, because we're going to need them all. He but, was. He was. Let me make sure I, because I don't want to exaggerate what I was looking at. A little bit disappointed with a series that led to one of the field goals. I don't know if he felt like. I know he was open coming out of the backfield on one of the plays. I think maybe second or third down. And maybe he felt like he should have gotten the ball down there in the red zone. And Tyler actually had to come over and sit down next to him and calm him down. Like, yo, like, be be cool. You know, his problem is health, right? He's battled injuries all spring long. And then late in the game, he pops his shoulder out of place just stiff-arming somebody. Like, that's all it was. He stiff-armed, linebacker, going out of bounds. It popped out of place. They came back in, popped it back in place, and he was good. He wanted to go back in. But, you know, the training staff were like, no, you're not going back in. That's it. You know, he, he was a little upset, but the biggest thing for him is health, bro. He's just one of those guys that has constantly battled injuries. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do when you, when you want to prove so much, but you're either getting hurt randomly or – yeah. You know, it doesn't – it's not shaping up how you would want it to, being an older guy in a young room. Uh, it's definitely heat on your neck because it's talent. You know, it's guys that can play. Guys are going to make plays if they get a chance. It's different from professional where you can, like quarterbacks, not let anybody else get reps because then, you know, you don't get a chance to see the other guy. But, you know, at a place like this, everybody's getting a chance. So, you know, it's really – not up to you when you play. You just got to make the most out of it. And when you get things that you can't control that happens to you, it's a little frustrating because now everything seems to be going wrong. You're not getting the ball when you're open. You're not getting enough touches. You're getting nicked up. Guys got to come talk to you. You're not happy with the quarterback play. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on with that. But I think just, you know, making the main thing the main thing, which has been Marcus Freeman's whole, whole, the whole thing, is, is going to be good for Logan Diggs, and the injuries is just unfortunate. But, um, you know, you got to be tough, and it's not an easy thing. But fortunately, you're not going to be carrying the ball 60 times, you know, because we got a lot of depth. So can you make them 10 carries count and stay healthy while doing it? We got to keep it a buck, though. 
it's a freshman coming on their tails, bro. <laughs> like we we gotta keep it a buck. He hasn't even walked across the stage and got his diploma yet. He's the real deal, though. <laughs> like, and I would love for him to be able to take his time and get thrown in there in certain spots where he can make impact plays. He doesn't have to be that number one guy right now. But you definitely have to get the ball in his hands. I don't care <laughs> if he's back there on kickoff with Chris Tyree, whatever it is. Just get the ball in his hands. Yeah, man, I think uh... – He's definitely making it hard for him not to get on the field. And it just comes down to what is Tommy's identity? Is he going to embrace the younger guys in the offense this year? Or is he going to keep his senior and go to his main go-tos like Michael Mayer and Kyron at the time? So, I would like to say the first call of the game was a brilliant call by Tommy. Braden Lindsey was, was open. Drew just didn't throw the ball. Yeah, I don't know I mean, why he just didn't pull the trigger. Like Braden was coming open on the post, he was one on one. Just didn't throw it, you know. And it's like I got reminded of Ian Book just in that moment. Like, dude, throw the ball. Throw I mean, you ball. saw Drew run up to Ian before the game, like he was his long lost brother. So I'm sure he had takes a lot from his own game and. You know, this is not the position to be safe anymore. I think Ian will be the last safe, forgettable type of play that that we should have at the position only because we've seen what it looks like to win. You know, you got to have some flair. Yeah. You got to make some plays. You got to really, you know, showcase yourself and be in New York damn near. Yeah. <laughs> damn near got to be in New York to, to, to that aspect so um i don't think uh drew has enough star power to put himself in new york mm. but i think that will help us having that will help us definitely be more secure about going into our situation especially against ohio state lucky the cast brandon joseph is a dude He's a dude, man. You do you like him returning punts though? No. <laughs> I felt the same way, bro. I felt the same way. I'm like, some look, guys just don't look right doing it. It's like, nah. It's not even that. I'm like, bro, look here, oh, man. No. Unless you are about to be the Deion Sanders back there returning kick. Yeah, I don't know. I I need you. I need you healthy, fam. I need this is not him. a spot I would like him at right now. Not that he can't do it, but I just, you know, it's 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 damn it's better than Salerno, but it's like I don't want him there either, you know. Oh man, and I understand they don't like you don't particularly like putting a freshman back there to return kicks. Hey, Amen. I don't even want to talk about the kickers, bro. Mm. Marcus was very disgruntled with special <laughs> teams. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. And like he was very disgruntled with special teams on Saturday. We just leave it at that. Man, I saw him like. They missed one field goal, and he just stared, stared at the kicker as he walked. <laughs> like, okay, okay, Marcus has that side. Like, okay, like he's a player's coach, but, uh, you know, I got a glimpse at, yeah, he can get after you. He'll let you know. Like, come on, man. We're not doing that. I hope we don't end up having to go to the soccer squad, man, looking for cats. During See, the fall. He, he, you know, he he couldn't take enough flights for everybody. He, <laughs> I mean, must, hey. have left, he must have left the five star kicker and punter off the uh off the list this time, go around, which is fine. 
More but punters, at the end of the day, I wasn't really worried about the punters. The best punters are coming in. So, <laughs> so we we knew that. We knew that. <laughs> and we'll, you know, like I said before, man, we're going after the best. Hey, we signed a five star long snapper, bro. I didn't know long snappers got five stars, but hey, but hey, he's the best that's doing it, I guess. Hey, look, I'm telling you, it's it's concerning because, you know, it wasn't even no fans in the stands for real. And you missing like that. So oh, that's, a, is, that's, that's true. It's never good when you missing special teams like that because you hate to look at them during practice because they don't do nothing. Look, man. So then when they miss, it just makes it even worse, you know. Hey man, you know how we have we have had discussions, man. You know the lack of respect I have for kickers already, man. <laughs> okay, because I have a theory, right? Like kickers are important. It's a tough, tough job. So I don't want to shortchange what they have to do. But I always tell people, like, if your kicker is like one of the loudest people in your locker room, that means you're not that talented as a team, bro. Mm. <laughs> if your kicker has a lot to say in the locker room, there's something wrong with the talent and the leadership in that locker room, bro. Yeah. So I used to tell people all the time at the left, Lovey Smith left, Lane Briggs retired, or Brian Erlacher retired. And the next thing you know, uh, he's still kicking with the 49ers. He used to kick with the Bears. What's oh, what's the kid's what's the dude's name? Either way, this dude was coming out saying stuff to the media, holding many press conferences at the games. Like, dude, you're a kicker. Like, what <laughs> You're a kicker. That's in, that immediately let me know that the Bears were on a downward slope, dude. Like, when your kicker is running his mouth, yeah, that lets me know everything. So, we'll get it together. I think group is really swaggy. I think he's going to end up being a streaky kicker. And, you know, I just hope and pray that he doesn't miss a big one. Like he's the type of kid that believes, really believes he can make the 52 yarder to win the game in Columbus. Like he believes it'll come down to something like that. Yeah, he believes that. But I need him to have the focus to make the 39 yarder in the first quarter. You know what I mean? I need you to be consistent. Yeah, Robbie Gold. Thank you, Jay Henry. Robbie Gold. Like, before he left the Bears, this dude was holding many press conferences, leaking information out of the locker room. Leaking information? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's why when people, like, celebrate this dude, I'm like, this dude was like a locker room cancer. Uh, he called a kicker a locker room cancer. Was a locker room cancer. It was, like, one of the main ones leaking information to the media. Leaking information. The kicker. Like, dude, you're a kicker leaking information, dude. Mm-hmm. As a kicker, man, I'm, I'm making my kicks and I'm going home, dude. Go home, bro. That's it. You know what I mean? Come, chill. Enjoy life. So I didn't want to overreact to what we saw on special teams, right? Because seeing them come out, they start with special teams at the beginning of every practice. I've seen, I've seen group come out and go nine for ten. You know what I mean? Blasting the ball. Good from 50 with, like, room to spare. I've seen it in practice. So I know what he's capable of. So fortunately, you know, he gets himself together. Yeah. But we, yeah, but we, you know, we sh- we're we shoring up other things. Special teams is something that's going to be a big part. We're going to have to find a difference making special teams in the return game other than just Chris Tyree. And we're going to have to find consistency with the punters and the kickers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just multiple steps that we have to make as a program. man. Because I can't think of the last punter that we had that I just felt like, oh, dude, every time he came out, like, oh, he's about to boot this 50 yards. I think Tyler. uh... Newsom? 
Not Tyler. I think Newsom. I think Newsom was good. He just became streaky towards the end. Okay. Okay. I think when he first was on, he was I I can guarantee 50. And then the longer the hair grew, the more streaky it was. It was the hair. It was I'm blaming the hair because I think he's a great kicker. Yo, D Rock Iris, thank you for tapping in. That's a good point. Man, nine and three, eight and four. If we can't get our field goals in check. Who are the four losses in? I keep telling people, man, this team is not losing four games. Yeah, bro. <laughs> the four losses. Come on, dude. Look, we had four losses, dude, really. Our field goal kicker has been inconsistent for the last two seasons. And we still won games. You don't like Jonathan real. Door, man. He don't like Jonathan. No, I do not. We need Justin you. We need you. We'll bring him back. Lead the all time leading scorer in Northern history, Justin Yoon. Yeah. Yoon, Reggie Ho, who, which is crazy, Reggie Ho couldn't kick beyond 48. But the dude was money inside 48. Like, yeah. He was money. He walked on the field. It was a 42-yard field goal. I was like, you didn't have to worry about it. Money. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we definitely got to get Yoon on the interview. Yeah, shout out to – I wonder why he stopped playing. That's a good question. That's a good question. That would be a great interview. I want to get – Craig Hendrick would definitely be a great interview. Long-time great NFL punt. And he kicked a little bit in Notre Dame. Hmm. So – That'll be great. I'm excited, man. I actually, man, I came away from watching this team saying, you know what? Defensively, I think they're going to be okay. Because we've been telling people they're going to run the ball. (laughs) We've been telling people, like, look, they're going to run the ball. Okay? Offensive line, the big nasties up front. That's the strength of your team. Your running backs, that's the most talented room you have on offense. Allow Tyler Buckner to work himself into some experience. Run the ball. Get to rolling. Go into November. Open it up a little bit more for Clemson and USC. And there you go. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like the best course of action especially early to let Tyler work his way through big games like Ohio State, win or loss is great experience for him, but also the ability for him to be able to feel comfortable that the offensive coordinator is not just going to throw the kitchen sink at him against good teams that could damage his confidence. Yeah. Yeah. So, look, man, I need a couple of minutes. All right? <laughs> Just a couple of minutes, man. So, the big buzz outside this weekend was the fact that Arnell Tate. (laughs) We're in LSU. And not only did they steal the gold throne concept from Notre Dame in the pictures, they called down Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. And it's funny because that cat Brian Kelly is false flagging, dude. Because Brian Kelly has not developed anybody. Like, there's nobody he can point to and say, yo, I developed that kid. But he's going to sit there and act like Joe Burrow is his. It's like that. Joe Burrow is more Ed Orgeron than he is you. Mm. Facts. So, like, the whole Dante thing didn't bother me at all. Didn't bother me at all. Because I felt like the Dante visit was driven by a lot of other things outside of Dante. Yeah. Just my opinion. The Carnell Tate thing, and I want to kill two birds with one stone because it's very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting because I saw a post on the message board of Irish Breakdown 
that literally said that I got duped. So I looked up the word duped, right? And the word duped specifically from a newspaper term or publishing term means that I published something that was a lie. Mm. That's what dupe means. Mm. You out here lying on folks, Sean? So, this is the thing. Our relationship with Carnell Tate existed before I took the job at Irish Breakdown. That's number one. Mm. Mm. That's number one. I started Irish Breakdown January 1st. We interviewed Carnell Tate before that. We're having conversations with him and Dante Moore. Yep. Before I got the Irish breakdown. That's number one. Number two, I have regular conversations with this dude. I would say the conversations I have with Carnell Tate, 30% of the conversations are about Notre Dame. 30. With two Chicago kids from the South Side that have mutual people that we know. And the more we talk, we find out that we know more people that connect us. Like, oh, you know that person? Yeah, no, no, no. So the fact that people would even think that I got duped is crazy. And then it's crazy. unfortunate because that puts an incorrect perception on Irish breakdown. As if Irish breakdown is reporting something that is untrue. That's unfair to the job that Ryan Roberts and Brian Driscoll do. Because I know the work I do. Like, I don't need anybody to tell me the work I do. No. At all. But it's unfair to them. The day before he visited on the 15th of March, I wrote a story on Irish Breakdown detailing how Notre Dame screwed up his recruiting under mm -hmm. the last regime and how Tommy Reese was scrambling at the end of the year to just recover and give Notre Dame a chance. Not once did I ever on this podcast or in my writing say that Carnell was coming to Notre Dame. Not once. I constantly tried to point out the job that Tommy Reese did to get back in the fight. Constantly. And at one point, based upon what Carnell said in his first interview, and then what he did by visiting Notre Dame eight times, like eight times. Who, who visits Notre Dame eight times if they're not interested? He only been in LSU what once, twice? It doesn't, maybe? doesn't matter, dude. Because I'm about to just eliminate all this dupe craziness. But people that said like he never liked Notre Dame. I've never known anybody to visit a place eight times that they don't like. And Number then two, one trip was just for his mom. Do you understand how narcissistic he would have to be to talk his mother? Yeah. Who did not like Brian Kelly? Didn't like Brian Kelly. And is on record as so. How narcissistic he would have to be to say, you know what? For clicks and likes, I'm just going to convince my mother to take a visit to Notre Dame. So it can look like I like Notre Dame. So I control Notre Dame fans. Like I'm gonna go through all of this just to get my mother on campus just so I can build up my social media, troll Notre Dame fans, dupe Sean Davis, dupe Irish Breakdown, dupe Lucky Lefty Podcast, all for me. Because he said that he had to convince his mother. If he didn't like us, why would he have to convince her of anything? He would have been agreeing with her. Yo. He had to convince her. And then was like, I'm not even staying for all the action that going on that weekend. I just wanted her to see it. I'll be back. That's what he said. I mean, what else do you need to hear? That's what he said. Not only you can't do that. He that was... back. Wait a minute. So this is the thing. Not only did he say that he would be back, he told us 
afterwards, because I can say it, we say it now. Afterwards, he said, I'll be back for the blue and gold game. Like, I love, man, Coach Stuckey, calls are going great. He talks to my mom. I'll be back for blue and gold game. Hit him up. You still coming back for the blue and gold game? No, nah, I don't think so. Okay. What happened? I don't know. Don't, don't matter. care. Don't Not matter. digging into it. Things yeah. happen in recruiting all the time. All the time. Schools screw, screw up, say something wrong, something happens, whatever it is, things change. I've also been on record. He's going to commit in August. That's what he said. Whomever he commits to, make sure you keep recruiting because it's not over. These are things that I've been telling you, right? We came after the second interview. He said in the interview, I love Notre Dame. I'm going yes. to go to Notre Dame if Dante doesn't go. And what did we say in the after show? Nah, fam. He's not coming to Notre Dame without Dante. Like, we hear you. But if Dante doesn't come, more than likely, he's not coming. You and can't, I think he's still taking visits because he hasn't committed. Dude, you can't dupe me. I'm from Chicago. Tell me where you're from, man. I'm from this. I know. I know Chicago dudes. Nobody's duping me. And if you don't <laughs> like the truth that I've been telling you, my Irish break. This is the point. This is the point because I know. I know we're spinning it different, right? I know we're spinning it different, and I know we're changing things. I know we're changing things, and I'm glad we're changing things, right? Because I was at a certain recruits baseball game last week and it got out and lo and behold his video from somebody else at that same player's baseball game on monday like oh word word dude we're changing things we know we're changing things right we know we're changing things who else has had the access to carnell i don't know oh, well, wait a minute all of a sudden rivals gets to sit down with him. And if you go watch the interview, the same thing he said in the interview, he's already said in two interviews with Lucky Left. Wow. The exact same thing. I think it's nothing new. So it, just has rivals. it just has rivals on it. So they but this, man. report comes out from on three, Notre Dame's no longer in it. He doesn't like Notre Dame. Okay. All right, that's fine. We never said he was coming to Notre Dame. What do we view ourselves as, bro? We constantly say. We do a podcast. We're here for the fans. We tell the truth. We tell the truth, and we look at our, we look at ourselves as assets to the program. That's it. We just a big recruiting extension. For the fans and for the players. So it's like, dude. And I see somebody in the chat say, well, he said it this way. It doesn't matter. The word duped well, was in there. No, I don't feel duped. Because, wait a minute. Because I don't have a reporter recruit relationship with Carnell Tate. Mm. I have a relationship with Carnell Tate. Mm. 30% of our conversation is about Notre Dame. That's 70% of conversation that has absolutely nothing to do with recruiting and Notre Dame. I mean, yeah, that's, that's simple math. It's stuff that he told us in 30 minutes after the interview that I would never share. That's right. That only somebody would share if they trust you. Those are the type of relationships I want to have with kids. Not a dupe one. Not a dupe one. I thought that was like Drake's duppy. Is that the same thing? Dupe? Duppy? So for me, I'm saying this not for me. I didn't say this for me. 
I'm saying this to say, stop being unfair to Brian Driscoll and Ryan Roberts. Don't put Carnell Tate and what he's doing has nothing to do with Irish breakdown. Absolutely nothing. Him and his family can do what the hell they want to do. And if they woke up one morning and they weren't feeling Notre Dame anymore, then so be it. Get over it. True. Get over it. This is not – if it was Dante Moore that we went all in on and we didn't get him, then I understand. It was a country full of wide receivers. Oh, yeah. The country full of wide receivers. Get over it. You don't have to go far. So what? Quarterback's a little more important. But and for someone yeah. and for someone that supposedly does not like Notre Dame, he's still talking to him. And the man is mom. So I usually give him two days after he comes back. I'll probably hit him up tonight. I mean, Marcus Freeman has been taking trips. If he felt like he was concerned, I'm sure he would get on a plane and go and go make sure that's okay. Man, look, it's funny. Like I said, I didn't. I just needed a few moments to say that. Not for me. Not for me. Who told you that Tommy Reeves put him back in the lucky left? He did. Who told you a week before? Wait a minute. Who told you a week before that he was coming to visit Notre Dame to bring his mom? Lucky left, he did. An Irish breakdown. Be it be a mess before. <laughs> Everybody else right. posted it like a week later. And you know how this information comes out? Not with me hitting them like, when you coming back? No. It comes via normal conversation. With him saying, oh, yeah, by the way, I'll be back up there, such and so, such and so. That's not, yo, I'm not that recruiting dude. I'm not going to be that recruiting dude. I actually care about these kids, and I actually care about them beyond Notre Dame. And that might rub some Notre Dame fans the wrong way. Mm. I do my job, but I actually care about these kids beyond Notre Dame. So if they don't pick, like if Christian Gray does, who was the first one to say, who was the first one to report via story and on the message board that Christian Gray was making his announcement July 4th? And I had it a week. I had it a week before all of the other big publications. A week. A week. Why? Why? Because I was talking to the kid on Easter Sunday. That's right. We were talking about how church went. That was a conversation. Mm. Wow. How was church? With his mom in the background. Wow. And she chimed in. And that's how the conversation came up. Well, yeah, my wow. mom, she doesn't want me to do it on the fourth, but I'm gonna do it on the fourth. I didn't ask him when you make man, when you making your commitment. I didn't say that. He gave it because of trust and mm. conversation. So I'm okay. cool. I'm happy that I do things different. I'm happy I can go to a baseball game Bowen, and spend an hour talking to Jeremy Bowen mm-hmm. about family coming from the South. What part of the South is your family from? So on and so forth. Why his son is playing. It's about relationships, man. And if everybody else wants to just talk about cookie cutter answers, then it's fine. That's not me, yo. We spend it different. That's right. And just my personal opinion, everybody needs to relax. Yeah. On that IG post, on the Dante's picture. Yeah. He wasn't trying to troll Notre Dame fans. He was actually trying to engage Notre Dame fans Mm -hmm. about whether or not they thought Dante was coming to Notre Dame. And it came across a different way 
But based upon that 30 minute conversation that we had with him after we start recording, we know why he asked that question. Right. So my whole point is be fair to Irish Breakdown and be fair to Brian Driscoll and Ryan Roberts. Yeah. That's all I have to say. That's it. That's fair. That's it. That's fair. That's it. Like, you can't hold anybody accountable. This goes for everybody that's covering Notre Dame football, man. Everybody. You report, you report what is being told to you. Mm-hmm. This is the beautiful thing about this. What has been written and reported, you can go watch it. We have an hour of footage of every quote that you can watch for yourself. Wow. That's pretty legit. That's it. So the only reason I spoke on this, once again, is not for me, because it's unnecessary heat going in the direction of Irish breakdown. And to be honest, they shouldn't even be getting the questions. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. And honestly, we I think last week we talked about it. Like, yo, he got duped. He did. We talked about crazy. how Kyle Casper duped Carnell. Yeah, it's true. The whole Tennessee situation. So, yo. I think he learned a lot from that. That's why he's keeping it loose in his recruitment, making sure he sees all the unknowns as well as who's going to stick with him while he does that because those probably are people that – yeah. Want to see to the end, and I'm glad, you know, we haven't seen anything at Notre Dame's camp where they're pressuring kids or, re- or reneging on offers yeah. that they've given the kids because they've taken those steps. Where before, I'm sure, I'm sure that Elston, if I went and visited somewhere else when I committed, was going to uh, probably take take my offers or something at that point. <laughs> no, it's just like with the Justin Rett situation, right? And you have to understand, tell me if I'm wrong, right? Tell me if I'm wrong. I didn't say, first of all, this this is what I'm talking about. I didn't say he wasn't a troll. I said he wasn't trolling ND fans underneath Dante Moore's picture. And if you had access to the information that we have access to, when that we're asked, privy to. That we're privy to. When he <laughs> asked a question, he asked that y'all think he's going to ND. He was engaging Notre Dame fans to see what they were going to say. And if you were privy to the extra 30 minutes we had, you will have a different perception of the question. That's but all I also saying. like that he's almost attaching himself to, you know, if he's going here, me too, kind of thing, because. Why well, propose the question? Yo, on the second interview, go in about 15 minutes. What did I say to him? I said, yo, I see what you and your boys are doing. Did I not say that? Yep. Did I not say that? Yep. I see what you're doing. I see how you're trying to play things on social media. And he laughed about it. I do. We're very well aware. These kids want to be Kevin Durant on social media so bad. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> last night. Don't say that. Don't say that. Like everybody that wants to put the same level with LeBron, that's 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 over. It's over. It's a wrap. So that's it. So please, like, for the sake of Irish breakdown, Brian Driscoll, Ryan Roberts, just drop it, man. Just just drop it. Just period. It's really not even a, a subject. It's no. not. It's not. And I'll, I'll step out on the limb and say this. Dante Moore wasn't impressed with that visit this weekend. He wasn't. He went because he wanted to be with his boy. It's my opinion. It's my opinion. But, hey, you know, I go to L.A., Malik might hit me up like, yo, let's go here. I don't really feel like going, but hey, that's my boy. 
That's right. Let's ride out. Let's ride out. Let's see what it's about. Like, look at the picture they took, I think, standing outside the stadium. I think it was like Carnell, his uncle, Jamais, Joe Burrow, and Dante. Dante's look is like, man, will I leave tomorrow? Mm. Like, what's up? Mm-mm-mm. Relax, man. Relax, man. He doesn't like Notre Dame, but you know he's re, he's reposting Marcus Freeman's Easter picture with his family on his IG page. You're like, yo, we have to, man, and we try to tell fans this all the time. Relax. This is what this is what I want to get to. I almost lost my train of thought. My ultimate point was when you're getting or when you're trying to enter into rarefied air and recruiting. Mm-hmm. This is what you're going to have to get used to as Notre Dame fans. Guys like this. Right? And as Notre Dame fans, we should be happy. Because yeah. if he is, if he is a narcissistic troll and all of those things as we let it play out, you have to ask yourself, do you even want him to be at Notre Dame? See? So it's like, yeah, let please let it play out. Show us who you really are, what you're really about. At the end of the day, we're in rarefied air, and recruiting is not about to go like it's gone the last 10 years. No. With us just taking guys just to take guys. No. In the big leagues, you have to fight for these dudes. That's right. These four stars, these big time five stars. It's rare fire air. You have to deal with a couple of prima donnas. Everybody's not about to be committing to you in April mm. in March, like they used to. Having the class almost filled before you go into the season. No. You're gonna have about four or five spots you're gonna have to fight for. Yeah. When the season starts. Some big time dudes. It's a new day. Get used to it. And just, we got to learn. We have to learn how to relax and just get used to it. Just get used to it. That's it. That's it. Just get used to it. That's the new lay of the land. That's the new lay of the land. Shout out to Sam Pendleton. Uh, shout out to Brandon uh, David Swain. Keon uh, Ely. Uh, Malik Elzey. Shout out to him for uh, leaving Notre Dame, going up to the Rivals camp in Indianapolis and winning MVP. Yep. We got plenty of wide receivers in Chicago for y'all, dude. Don't worry. Uh, don't worry. If one doesn't want to come, don't worry. Don't worry. Uh-huh. It's all good. We got plenty. I think they also gave an offer to a linebacker from Chicago, Kenwood. Out of class oh. 24, Marquis Lightfoot. Okay. He got an offer from Notre Dame on Saturday. So, look, man. Number one class in America. And it's going, it's going to get better. Only going to get better. Oh, for sure. For sure, for sure. Ready? It's time to get petty. Oh, we did a good job executing. Now, are you upset with something? And fire up the Petticoat Junction train. I just don't like you. You don't? No. What is today's petty historic Petty Junction? Yo, petty story of the day. Anora Whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. That premium American whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. I got to be petty, bro. <laughs> I got to put the Boston Celtics on the <laughs> Yeah. They, they guarded really this they man. They need to be celebrated. They need to be celebrated. <laughs> 
Put him on a petty train. Yeah. <laughs> Put him on a petty train, man. The way they did it. <sighs> man, I think Stephen A. something that I didn't even know. You know what's petty about it? Kyrie Irving left Boston, and when he left, he said yeah, he said those guys weren't mature enough to win. And here we are, years later. He's the they're the guys, the same guys that he couldn't win with, are the ones sending him home via sweep. I don't understand. See, I'm going to make a statement. You might disagree. As good as Kyrie Irving is as a player, if Kyrie Irving disappeared today, the game of basketball would not miss him. I don't know about all Listen, that. Look, fans would miss him. I'm talking about the game. Mm. He doesn't move the game like that. He's not KD, Braun. He's not one of the general dude. He's not a dude that you talk about an era and you're like, oh, man, it's that dude. He's just right. an entertaining basketball player, dude. I, I see that. He's not the face of the franchise. He's not about to lead you to a championship. He's not about to lead anybody. He's just a really talented dude that can dribble, shoot, drop 50 every now and then. That's about it. That's about that's, it. That's about it. That's all. So he is put, a champion, though. You put them on a petty train, you can put the Bulls on the petty train tonight. Because they're gone. You talk about they're gone. Yeah, they're gone. Like, get them the <laughs> where they go. Petty train. Uh, dude, I'll, I'll wait until tomorrow. But the Atlanta Hawks, they get them, get them up out of there, too. They going home? Up out of there. It, look, good. man, I don't know if you saw this. Security for the Minnesota Timberwolves, man. <laughs> Y'all don't have to drag that lady like that, man. Oh, no, they drag her like they just take her to the gulag. And I don't know where she thought she was going. Yeah, when did she saw the dude. As soon as she stepped over, buddy, she looked to the left. <laughs> like, she should have known. Dude, she looked like, to lay there flat. Dude, as soon as they got on, she tried to lay flat like I'm done. They said, No, nah, we about to embarrass you. Oh, they drug her like they were mopping up the floor, bro. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The security, I mean, they did the job, but the way they drug her off the floor, I'm like, Come on, man, they ain't even pick her up, they just no, lit her no. off the court. They just drug her. And I'm like, Oh, man. they probably beat her up too, you know how they, yes. Yes. But we come back on this court. <laughs> and I want to put I want to put my city on the petty train, bro. Uh-oh. It was almost 80 degrees Saturday, bro. It was about 67 on Sunday. Dang. We had we had 48 shootings, though. 48 shootings. 48 shootings in two days, bro. Damn. And for the first time, like I enjoyed myself for my birthday, but I'm like, I don't even know if I want to come into the city anymore, dude. Like, this is crazy. Like, what? Are... I mean, as soon as it got just the first warm day, it went up. I don't know, man. That's what I was trying to tell you. Like, when we had that debate about guns and stuff, I'm like, fam, I'm trying to tell you. It's different up here. Like, like they are literally just waiting for the first opportunity. Like, it's real. It's sad, man. And the one thing they talked about, the police commissioner came on, and he immediately talked about the number of illegal guns on the streets that come through Indiana. That was the first the problem. And he was like, it's only going to get worse 
because of the number of illegal guns that flow through our neighboring states. So, man. Yo, so you said Cam Cam Hart is going to be going with Kyle Hamilton? Yeah, he'll be there in the Vegas, Vegas for the draft. He's going to be out there with him for the draft. It was good to see uh, all the former players, man. I didn't get a chance to bump it to uh, Raghid Ismail. Mm. He was there. I was looking for him, though. Yeah, I mean, he, he was uh, in and out for sure. How did everything go with Irish play, uh, Players Club and – Everything you did with a Nora Whiskey. Irish Player Club was great. Something you want to be a part of uh, if you're a fan of Notre Dame. Unlimited access, ultimate access, exclusive access. We threw a tailgate in the middle of campus, something that hasn't been done. Uh, got the players involved, come by after the game. Some old players, some new players. Uh, and it was great. I mean, I think this is something that in the future is going to hold a lot of weight for serious fans and it's going to be important uh, that you get in early before it's too late and too hard to get into in the future. Yeah, get into it, grab hold, support. Uh, also, uh, fund. Tomorrow's show, we'll play clips from our interview with Brady Quinn. We actually met with him last Wednesday. Yep. Before all of us headed down to South Bend, we'll play exclusive clips from that interview. He has some technical difficulties with his, his phone. So we'll try to pull the best clips and show you that and talk about it on the show. Don't forget, friends of the University of Notre Dame, the NIL, Tom Mendoza, Brady Quinn, what they're doing. There's another one coming with another former Notre Dame player. He has another big NIL company coming. So the NIL game is changing. Notre Dame is taking it, you know, the bull by the horns and saying, yo, we're not just about to sit back and it's being done by the former players. That's what I love the most. That's right. The former players are getting involved and saying, yo, we're going to create this space for us to have an advantage in recruiting. And we're not about to allow Marcus Freeman to fail strictly because of the NIL. You have to love That's it. Right. You absolutely have to love it. Before we go, bro, Louie got to die. Yeah, Louie got to die. I told you at the beginning of this season. Yeah. I'm like, what is, like, why is she so power hungry right now? What's going when, on with that? When she, she showed go. up and she had the bad cop pull the piece. Yeah, like I what? Said, okay. I said, okay. Yeah. I would have told, too, it was Louie. Best, best line on TV in a while. Dude, no, no. That whole clip, when they queued up, the feeling walking the, through the that yeah. song, they cued the song up, yeah, and that dude got to the yeah, dude. yeah, that was, was great me. TV. That was great, great TV. Whoever did the audio video editing of that scene mm -hmm. and the way it played out, fantastic, fantastic cinematography, fantastic. That's right, that's right. I'm like, yo, that's how you end the season. That's that's how you end the season with with wanting to come wanting to come back. And the season wasn't that great. It was slow. It had some pieces where you like, uh, it yeah. didn't need that. Yeah. But overall, it ended the right way. You go from that to his conversation with his mom. I'm like, that's that's the way to end the season. That's right. I was I was I was sorry to see my boy had to die though. Oh, the gun guy. Yeah. Yeah, he had to go. Yeah. Jay Chillin says, thank you for the ride. It was good seeing you. That's right. He missed me. It was great. It's all good. Every, I'm telling you, everybody that showed us love, we greatly appreciate you. Like I said, the website with the merch will be up very soon for orders. And then the first set, I think the first set of orders will be pre-order. And then after that, you know, we'll be printing everything up as soon as you place the order. That's right. For everything. That's up. right. Come get some of the Lucky Lefty merch. We spend it different. We appreciate y'all shouting us out when we saw y'all at the game. We're going to have a lot more coming. Lee Marie, good question. For some reason, are these shootings not reported nationally? I know there's been a big effort to work with you. Praying that outreach programs will make a change for all of our sakes. Yo, that's why I'm, 
Uh, that's why I approach re uh, recruiting differently. I'm heavily involved with outreach uh, through our ministry. And uh, I've been doing it for over 20 years and it's a great need. It's a great need in the city of Chicago. I'm actually working with a couple of friends of mine trying to set up a program for youth to come through each and every summer to play sports. And then they play sports half of the day. And then the rest of the day, they learn how to deal with media and to become part of the media. So I'm working on that. And I hope God, you know, I hope, of course, I know my guy Malik will come in for that week, help out Jared Payton, uh, who's in the media and play and some other guys, man. So we're trying to build it, trying to put the 501c3 together. That's a task itself to get that certification. So, you know, pray for us that we get it done so we can make an impact uh, for young people in the city of Chicago. So for my boy, Malik Zaire, the original lucky lefty himself, I'm Sean Davis. We've appreciated you guys joining us. We'll see you tomorrow for another episode of the Lucky Podcast. We spend it different.